Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Opioid Crisis, How Do We Get Here conference call. Your host for today, Mark Lausch. You may now begin. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Lausch, uh, and I'm a social worker and a certified addiction counselor. And we're going to talk today a little bit about the opioid crisis and the antecedents to that. Uh, first of all, I need to start out with the continuing education disclosure. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, and uh, uh, continuing education is going to be provided by our partner, Metastar. And we need to tell you that no commercial support has been received for this learning activity. Uh, the speakers and planners, that being me, have reported no conflicts of interest. Uh, for CE credits or a certificate of attendance, you must attend the entire session and complete an online evaluation that will be sent to your email address that you registered for the conference with. Um, if there are multiple viewers in the room, um, you can simply send me an email, and I'll have my, my colleague Malia post my email on the, uh, in the chat box. You can send me an email, tell me that you viewed the event, and I will forward it to the, uh, uh, our partners at Metastar to get you a certificate. Um, so social workers who would like to eat must complete the online evaluation, and for social workers, there is a post-test uh, that's going to be included with the evaluation. You will get all that in an email um, shortly after the, uh, the webinar, usually about five to seven to ten days. Um, and so we encourage everyone to complete the evaluation and uh, let us know how you did. Okay, and here's some, just some information about the approval numbers for social workers for Wisconsin and Minnesota and Michigan, and there'll be one continuing education credit hour. Okay, so the objectives for today, we're going to talk about uh, and hope you'll be able to recognize the scope and severity of the opioid crisis in Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, and in the U.S. Um, I'm part of the Lake Superior Quality and Innovation Network that includes the states, Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, so we're going to include some uh, some brief statistics on the opioid crisis in each of those states. Um, hope you're going to be able to identify the antecedents to the crisis. We're going to talk a little bit about treatment options for opioid uh, abuse and dependence, and then look a little bit at policy implications for addressing the opioid crisis. And then finally, just a, just a brief slide on understanding opioid dependence as a disease. Okay, so crisis, what crisis? Well, it is, it, it, the question is, is this a mess? Well, in, in one of my favorite books by Cormac McCarthy called um, No Country for Old Men, the sheriff was surveying a scene of, of, of carnage caused by uh, uh, Mexican drug smugglers, and his deputy said to him, well, sheriff, is this a mess? And his response was, well, if it isn't, it'll do until the real mess comes along. And I think that that kind of is a good way to kind of, kind of frame this, this issue. Um, yeah, it is a mess. Um, so, as the, as the slide reads here, that, you know, drug overdose is the leading cause of death for Americans under age 50, and um, the number in 2015, there were over 50,000 overdose deaths in the U.S., and that included 63 of those uh, uh, were opioid involved. Uh, so, that's an average of 91 opioid overdoses, each overdose deaths each day. Um, and so, deaths from prescription opioids. Um, have quadrupled since 1999, and between 2010 and 16, heroin-related heroin related overdose deaths increased by a factor of five. Um, and now we're going to look at, uh, and the next slide is going to talk a little bit about the, the, the national overview. Um, and you can see that overdose, overdose deaths involving opioids um, increased dramatically uh, from 2000 up to 2016, and this was from the CDC. So you can look at any opioids, synthetic opioids, heroin, and natural and semi-synthetic opioids. Um, so again, it is a crisis. And here, here's a, another um, uh, infographic by the CDC, and this, these are all going to be available in the slides. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, and you can preview them or re review them or, uh, uh, at your own leisure. So we'll go on to the next slide, and now we're going to look at Michigan a little bit. So. In 2016, there were about 2,300 deaths from overdose in Michigan. Um, at the same time, there were about 11.4 million prescriptions for opioids written in Michigan. Um, and then again, some of the statistics from Michigan Department of uh, Community Health Records and Health Statistics, um, 319 heroin-related deaths in 2013, and that was a 58% increase. And also one in five drug poisoning deaths in Michigan were related to heroin. Uh, and again, it's, 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 
uh, concurrent with the, the national statistics that the overdose overdose deaths from opioids rose 17 17 times in 1999. And again, um, just a, just a, uh, uh, some statistics to look at. Um, and again, um, I'll leave that up on the screen for a second, and you guys can look at that when you get the slide. Um, so we're tenth. Michigan is tenth in uh, in national ranking for number of opioid uh, pain med prescriptions. Um, we're ranked fifteenth for the number of drug overdose overdose deaths, and sixty seven percent of drug overdose deaths in Michigan are attributed to opioids and heroin. So Michigan does continue to be a source state for diverted prescription drugs, which are distributed to Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Now, these come up through what they call the, the um, uh, heroin highway, which is I-75, um, and uh, they call that the Oxycontin Highway, too, which would go up into, uh, uh, come from Michigan uh, down into Kentucky and some of the uh, 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 southern states. Uh, street prices are for, for diverted prescription uh, drugs. Um, oxycodone, um, hydrocodone, uh, Percocet, Percodan, uh, run from 35, excuse me, 30 to 45 per pill in Michigan, uh, but may sell for double or triple the value when distributed in other states. And in, um, in 2014, the Michigan Automated Prescription System, or MAP, reported 12 million prescriptions were issued for hydrocodone or Vicodin, Xanax, Oxycodone, Clonopin, Ativan, Ultram, and Valium. Now, this is interesting because um, drug addicts prefer what they call the holy trinity, which is really three specific drugs. It would be an opioid. Uh, it could be anything from hydrocodone to oxycodone, um, a benzodiazepine, preferably um, Xanax, but it could be Clonopin, it could be Ativan, and then, uh, I, I, I try to pronounce this right, Crisoprodol or Soma, which is a Schedule Four. It didn't used to be a Schedule drug, but now it's a Schedule Four um, substance. And the combination of those three drugs is, is referred to as the Holy Trinity for their euphoric and um, sedative properties. Now we're going to jump to Minnesota. So again, just some statistics here: overdose deaths there have risen 66% between 2010 and 2016. Um, and that, interestingly enough, prescription opioids are the most common cause of overdose death, accounting for about 49 of them. And again, the availability of, of prescription opioids in medicine cabinets, um, by diversion, by prescriptions that don't, uh, that, that aren't fully taken and that are, that are then diverted into the illegal, illegal pathways. And then heroin, uh, it, uh, involves overdose death and synthetic opioid deaths, uh, have increased also pretty significantly. And again, here's a, a uh, this is from the, the Minnesota Department of Health, and we can see that um, that uh, uh, opioid-induced deaths have increased significantly, along with uh, along with other um, opioid deaths. And just a statistic here, that's from uh, Hope Act uh, Live in Wisconsin, or Live Hope Act Live in Wisconsin. Uh, and then again. This, uh, this is looking at um, heroin deaths being the highest among those age 20 to 29, prescription drug, drug deaths highest among those age 50 to 54. Now, that's an interesting statistic, the, the prescription drug, drug deaths, I'm having a hard time saying that today, highest among those age 50 to 54. There's some speculation on why this is happening. And, and, and some of the thought behind this is that they're baby boomers, right? So baby boomers tend to be more familiar with softer drugs, um, LSD, uh, uh, marijuana, and it, at the time when the boomers were young, and I'm a boomer myself, I'm 59 years old, um, cocaine. Cocaine, in fact, when I was younger, was thought to be a relatively harmless substance. Uh, we know differently now, but, but boomers tend to be more familiar and more um, open to, to drug use, especially among softer drugs. So they might likely be more prone to experiment with substances such as opioids or benzodiazepines, um, and then for for various reasons become dependent upon them or or accidentally overdose. And they also have easy access to these prescription drugs um, for age-related issues, um, chronic pain, um, other related issues, at, you know, uh, 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 accidental, uh, uh, you know, limb breaking or you know things like that. So so those adults between age 50 
to 54 um, do have um, easy access or easier access to opioids. So then in, uh, so in 2016, about 827 people in Wisconsin died from opioid overdoses. Uh, and that, this is the interesting statistic here is that it's more than the number of killed in car crashes. Okay, so we got the, we, we got the prevalence and the statistics out of the way. So how did we get here? So other than America's overwhelming desire to alter their consciousness and expendable income to do so, there were some definite antecedents to this current opioid crisis. So the, the antecedents to this uh, would be the, uh, a focus on pain management uh, and, and viewing pain as a vital sign, and then subsequently increased opioid prescribing coming from that. Um, misinterpreted data, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Porter and Jick study in just a minute. Um, market saturation of opioids. Uh, Purdue Frederick with oxycodone, um, they uh, were very, very successful in marketing oxycodone as a safe opioid uh, compared to others, such as maybe morphine or methadone. Um, and so there was a tremendous market saturation of opioids that occurred. Um, after that, and with the influx of, of the, this, this uh, market saturation of opioids, many people became addicted. There were many, many, many pill mills. Uh, Florida, West Virginia, Kentucky, um, uh, those states saw a huge increase in doctors fraudulently prescribing um, opioids, and it was a huge, um, a huge uh, financial uh, boon. Uh, for, for those physicians. But then the DEA Department of Justice started to enforce pill mills, uh, started to uh, enforce um, uh, uh, drug laws to close down pill mills. So there was increased focus on diversion of pharmaceutical opioids. And um, so as, as that diversion occurred through these pill mills, the DOJ started cracking down on these pill mills. And then through that, Became it, 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 somewhat at the same time, but also in response to this, the, the, the crackdown on pill mills meant there were less pills available, that there was market saturation of heroin by investing in the cartels. So we're going to look at we're going to look at each of these in a little more detail. So pain management and pharma involvement. This is from the 1980s. So the World Health Organization um, developed guidelines for treating terminally ill cancer patients with progressively larger doses of opioids, and they called this the ladder. And morphine was considered an essential drug on the World Health Organization, quote unquote, ladder. Um, so there was a paradigm shift from more conservative usage of opioids and fears of using them in progressively higher doses. So the paradigm shift was that it was okay to prescribe um, opioids because patients had, had, had pain and we wanted to, physicians so wanted to treat that pain. Um, and then, um, it, then it, uh, sort of at the same time, the American Pain Society coined the term or uh, the phrase pain, the fifth vital sign, signifying that pain management had a rightful place in patient care and opioids could be used for this purpose. So this is all well and good, right? I mean, so um, the, the World Health Organization recognizes that um, it's, important to treat, uh, it's important to treat pain, and I would fully agree. I had surgery several months ago, and trust me, I was very glad that my pain was treated um, with opioids for a brief time. Um, and, and and so it, that's all right and good, and it, it's important for patients to, to get appropriate pain management because for many years they were not because physicians, nurses were afraid of opioids because of, of, because of addiction and because of dependence. Um, and so that paradigm began to shift to more uh, liberal uh, use of opioids, and that came in, 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 in uh, along with the uh, recognizing pain as, as the fifth vital sign. Also, patient satisfaction surveys. Uh, Press Gaming is one company who performs these surveys for doctors and hospitals. They focus a lot on pain management as a component of overall patient satisfaction. So there was a, a push for hospitals, for physicians to be able to treat pain um, with their patients. So they were getting messages that, you know, that, that, that it's appropriate to treat pain. Don't be afraid to treat pain. Opioids are, are, are necessary medications to treat pain. And if you don't treat the pain, the patients are going to complain and our, 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 our uh, scores are going to go down. Um, 
in a physician and, and or hospital, of course, could negatively be impacted by ignoring or not satisfactorily uh, treating uh, pain. Um, then we go to the move into the aggressive. This is all happening in the 80s. Um, so then we turn to the aggressive marketing of opioids as risk-free, and this is where Porter Jack comes in. Now, Dr. Herschel Jack and Jane Porter wrote a letter to the New, Jer New England Journal of Medicine in January of 1980, and it, it, in the name of the art, the, the letter to the editor. So it wasn't a study. It was a letter to the editor. It said, addiction rare in patients treated with narcotics. And so I'll just, it's just a paragraph, so I'll read it to you. It says, recently we examined our current files to determine the incidence of narcotic addiction in 39,946 hospitalized patients who were monitored consecutively. Although there were 11,882 patients who received at least one narcotic preparation, there were only four cases of reasonably well-documented addiction in patients who had a history of addiction. The addiction was considered major in only one instance. The drugs implicated were buparidine, which is Demerol, in two patients, Percodan in one, and hydromorphone of Dilaudid in one. We conclude that despite widespread use of narcotic drugs in hospitals, the development of addiction is rare in medical patients with no history of addiction. Okay, so what Purdue did with that is they took that letter to the editor, and they develop marketing materials to promote their drug OxyContin or Oxy, OxyContin, which is OxyContin. And they use that, that letter to the editor um, in their marketing materials to aggressively market um, OxyContin to physicians across the country, across the country. So um, in the years that followed, the letter was used by pain specialists, nurses, and it was used in seminars, workshops, everywhere as evidence that opioid painkillers had a low risk of addiction. Specifically, the letter was used to support the assertion that less than 1% of opioid users became addicted to the drug, and that was huge in Purdue's marketing. Now, again, this wasn't Purdue. Um, this was used by physicians and, and specialists in the field and, and people talking about, um, about um, using opioids as a pain management tool. So JIT's analysis proved really no such thing. You know, the, the study analyzed a database of hospitalized patients at Boston University Medical Center who were given small doses of opioids in controlled settings to ease suffering from acute pain. So these patients were not being given long-term opioid preparations that they were free to administer at home. So nevertheless, medical groups such as the American Pain Society and the American Pain Foundation used the letter as a jumping-off point uh, and began calling or began promoting uh, the idea of pain as the fifth vital sign. Okay, so that so so then we see in the in the in the 80s through the 80s we saw that the, the, the pain is the vital sign, the uh, the Prestini scores um, uh, pushing physicians to overly prescribe opioids to, to treat uh, chronic pain or pain in general, and um, and then aggressive pharmaceutical marketing. So in the 1990s, it could be seen as the, DEA, the area of DEA enforcement in, in influx of Mexican heroin. So as the DEA began to clamp down, the Drug Enforcement Administration began to clamp down on fraudulent pill mills um, and illegal diversion of opioids, there was less availability, which meant increased prices. Um, and so uh, addicts could pay up to 30 to $50 per tablet of OxyContin. At the same time, Mexican drug cartels, in addition to marijuana and cocaine, started focusing on opium poppy cultivation and importing Mexican brown heroin, okay? Um, and so essentially, um, the, the Mexican brown heroin was cheaper, 5 to $10 a pack. It was a whole heck of a lot easier, especially in some areas of the country, to obtain the pharmaceutical opioids. And despite interdiction, there were huge amounts of, of um of uh, Mexican brown heroin entering the country. There's just no way that they could keep up with that influx. So opioid addicts then generally made the move from prescription opioids to heroin due to its availability oil price. Um, you know, 30 to $50 per tablet of OxyContin, and you might need three to four of those to get a high, um, and uh, as opposed to 5 to $10 a pack for heroin, um, and uh, you can get it uh, relatively easy. 
Um, and so it, it, made, it made absolute sense that the addicts then shifted uh, uh, from prescription opioids to, um, to heroin. So as the shift occurred, there were spikes in heroin overdoses because of the inconsistency of illegal heroin and the increases in potency. So the Mexican brown heroin that was coming in was significantly more potent than the uh, than, than had been seen previously in the 70s. Um, and so the, the potency increased from about 20 to 30 percent to about 50 to 80 percent purity. So that would mean that someone that, that might be using heroin that they would take three to four packs to, to achieve um, uh, uh, euphoria, um, they, you know, they would use that same three or four pack because that's what they, that they were used to, and with the purity increase, they would um, they would overdose and die. Um, so, uh, uh, so recently, too, synthetic, we've all heard about this, synthetically produced fentanyl and carfentanyl from China and the European Union and Asian supply routes have contributed to overdoses because um, that's really, really cheap. Um, a lot of that, the fentanyl and car fentanyl now is coming from China. It, it's incredibly cheap for them to produce. And the amount, I saw a presentation a, a, a month ago, the amount of car fentanyl that would take to kill a human being is like small, about the size of a grain of sand. So it, it's just absolutely amazing. Fentanyl is probably a few grains of sand to kill somebody. Car fentanyl is about a grain of sand. Um, so it's just amazing the, the small amounts that are needed to cause an overdose. So, so drug distributors um, would get the brown heroin. Uh, they could then then lace it with fentanyl or carfentanil. Um, and unfortunately, uh, uh, patients die from this. You know, and the flip side of that too is the idea that some addicts would actually look to that as good product. So, as a friend of theirs overdose. They would view that that product as something that they would need to have or try to obtain because it was so good. They would just use lots of it, then their poor friend who overdosed did. So, um, uh, an interesting website that you guys can go to look at um, is the DAA Diversion website, and it's basically www.daa. DEADiversion.com. You can just put DEA diversion in your Google or your Bing search engine, and it'll come up. And so, I, I, I mentioned that because with this change in paradigm from prescription, you know, prescription, um, prescription um, uh, pharmaceutical uh, to Mexican brown heroin, the Department of Justice began to clamp down on physicians who prescribe or overly prescribe opioids. Um, and the DA Diversion website has a whole section on cases against doctors who have been indicted for um, and have a DA license and sometimes criminal charges um, uh, posed against them for illegally prescribing opioids. And the number of cases um, increased significantly in the 90s through the 2000s. Okay, so we talked again about, so the antecedents, we've already talked about them. How did we get here, right? So how did we get here? As a reminder, we had the, uh, we had the, uh, focus on pain management. Pain is the fifth vital sign. The World Health Organization and, uh, and, and others, um, uh, uh, promoting the use of opioids as appropriate pain management. Um, the misinterpreted data, the port of study, and the pharmaceutical industry and others um, using that misinterpreted data to, to market saturate um, uh, uh, the country with uh, prescription opioids. Um, crackdown on that, and then the, uh, the, the change to um, heroin because of the decreased, decreased availability of prescription opioids and the increase in price. And then... Um, the, uh, the market saturation with um, by Mexican cartels around heroin, and what we see today with um, uh, 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 overdoses caused by fentanyl and carfentanil. So those are the antecedents. So where do we go from here? So where do we go from here? So opioid addiction is treatable. There's, there's no doubt about it. It's treatable. Um, there are many um, uh, modalities to be used for, for treatment. We have medication-assisted treatment, which would be using methadone, buprenorphine, and or uh, naltrexone to treat uh, opioid addicts. Um, uh, uh, we have detoxification asking phase treatments, residential inpatient units, uh, intensive outpatient, recovery homes, halfway homes, three-quarter homes, and, of course, psychotherapy, 
with cognitive behavioral therapy. So addiction opioids and other substances is considered disease by the American Medical Association, by the American Society of Addiction Medicine, um, and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, and just about everybody in the scientific field. You'd be rare to find somebody, um, a, a scientifically based, um, a physician, clinician, researcher that would dispute that addiction is a disease. Um, research shows there, there are definite structural changes in the brain that occur with repeated exposure to opioids that alter the way the individual functions and perceives being without the drug. And we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that. Um, but there are structural changes in the brain that occur um, with, with addiction uh, that cause cravings and, and, and desire for repeated use. So the treatment modalities I mentioned, um, medication-assisted treatment is the, uh, is the uh, treatment of choice at this point in time for opioid uh, dependence. Um, Absence-based treatments do work, um, although the relapse rate for those are, are, are quite high. Um, so medication assisted treatment, we'd be using methadone. Uh, now methadone is specifically dispensed in a, uh, uh, a OTP or an opiate, opioid treatment program, opiate treatment program, and there are really strict guidelines for the, uh, for the, uh, for, the for the, the administration and dispensing of methadone. Patients have to show up at a clinic or a designated location. They typically have to be monitored almost every day with their dose for a period of time before they can get medicine to take home. Buprenorphine, um, the trade names for this would be Suboxone and um, um, uh, uh, Zubsol. And buprenorphine is a Schedule III. Um, opioid is a combination agonist-antagonist, meaning it has opioid-like properties, but not as strong as a methadone and morphine. Um, and that can be dispensed by physicians who have um, data training. So that's the Drug Abuse Treatment Act of 2010. So the physicians can go through a, um, uh, a, a training that will enable them to prescribe buprenorphine to their patients um, for um, opioid addiction. And then naltrexone. Naltrexone goes by the name of Revia or, um, uh, oh, I forget the other name, the, the injectable Vivitrol. Now naltrexone was used initially as an opioid blocker. Um, and it was taken orally, and this was available since the 80s. Um, it was taken orally, and it blocks the effects of uh, exogenously administered opioids or, admitted, or opioids that are administered from outside the body. So somebody who takes pills or injects um, an opioid, um, the naltrexone will block the effects of the opioid at the receptor site. The problem with, with naltrexone, the oral version, is, is that um, you have to take it every day to build up a steady state to have that blockade. And that blockade is, um, uh, it can be overridden by excessively high doses of opioids. Now, again, I don't know how much of that it would take to, 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 to override the blockade, but, uh, uh, th again, if you're trying to do that, you might risk an overdose. Um, so the Vivitrol is what's being used more, more recently. If that's a depot injection that is given, meaning that it's injected, um, intramuscularly once a month, and it's in a, um, Kind of a viscous um, uh, delivery system that 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 eats out slowly over time into the body and provides 30 days or so coverage of this blockade. Um, and um, so, uh, medication assisted treatment uh, very very important. Uh, detoxification absence based treatments. I worked um, before I worked for LSQN. I worked in a um, uh, absence based inpatient treatment program. And um, we were successful um, with treating opioid addiction, um, uh, and typically with older patients, those that had more established careers, um, family support, um, had tried a few times to detox and withdraw uh, previously. Um, we did not have real good luck with young patients 18 to, 18 to 35 in maintaining abstinence with just um, and we paid detox in an inpatient program. Many of those relapsed. There were some that stayed sober or stayed abstinent, but many, many relapsed. Um, and then there's other outpatient programs in psychotherapy, too. Okay, so where do we go from here? We're going to look a little bit about law enforcement so um, and uh, elimination of pill mills and legal physician prescribing. Um, so that's been going on. Um, the Department of Justice and the Drug Enforcement Administration have been 
are working diligently to eliminate pill mills and legal physician prescribing. Um, as I said, that, that DEA diversion website, um, if you look into there, are cases against doctors, you can look and there, there, there are years worth of data that will show that they've been making uh, tremendous strides in, in um, trying to um, um, eliminate pill mills. Pharmacies that, that uh, uh, um, uh, ignore red flags and prescribe excessive doses of opioids and um, uh, uh, physicians who do it for, for financial gain. However, the only downside of this is that it, it, um, it leaves legitimate medical professionals alone to practice medicine and treat pain with opioids responsibly, right? So it, 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 it's difficult because there are patients out there that truly need high dose opioids. They need um, they, they need this for um, uh, their, their treatment plan. And a lot of physicians now are becoming afraid to prescribe opioids because of um, fear of the Department of Justice um, scrutinizing their, their prescribing records, um, their, um, uh, uh, their, their adherence to, to proper medical practice and standards, and they're afraid. So uh, sometimes a, a lot of physicians now have gone out of pain management, um, leaving patients who, who need this, um, this, this type of care um, uh, hard-pressed to find other prescribers who will um, uh, take up the uh, take up the mantle and, 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 and care for them. Um, drug court, um, awesome um, intervention. Um, they allow for nonviolent drug offenders to enter treatment, and those are, are the, the requirements in drug courts. Um, that's a takeoff from the, the, the DUI courts that started um, many a few years ago, probably about 10, 15 years ago, um, where persons with DUIs could go into a, a DUI court or a, a, a drunk court and um, um, have strict requirements upon them um, for a year or so, two years maybe. And then uh, once they complete the program, they would uh, they would be able to maintain their driver's license and and, uh, and and graduate. So drug courts are I think are are, are very effective in um, um, uh, helping drug offenders enter treatment and and to, and to look at addiction and dependence as a as as a uh, medical condition and not as a punitive uh, and, and not as a criminal or take a punitive action toward them. Um, in Detroit and many many other communities. Um, addicts can present themselves at um, at police at various police departments, state police departments across Michigan, and certain there there are, there are more and more uh, police departments every every um, every few months that, that that take up this program, um, and it allows addicts to show up at, at a uh, law enforcement um, location and be connected with a volunteer who will help um, get them into treatment at that moment, at that moment. And I think in Michigan it's called the Angels Program. Um, I, there's something very similar to that, and I know there are, in fact, they just, they just had a press release recently where, uh, the last month or so, where probably seven or eight other police departments in um, the uh, southeast Michigan have um, um, started uh, participating in this program. Um, interdiction is another um, another way to uh, uh, to curb the opioid epidemic, um, interdiction. So we are, we in Michigan are in what is considered a high intensity drug traffic area or the Hyatt. And, uh, so Detroit, Chicago, Toledo, I mentioned earlier about I-75 being the heroin highway. So, so law enforcement is, is, is one way to go to curb this, um, epidemic. So in, um, Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, we all have opioid task forces currently working to develop policy and treatment. Um, so they develop things like prescribing guidelines and protocols that are being implemented by um, hospital systems and, and um, uh, 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 health plans, HMOs, um, ACOs, things like that. Um, increasing access to overdose prevention tools such as Narcan or Naloxone. Um, which is available in a nasal spray to immediately reverse the effects of an opioid overdose. Um, and there's currently, in, in Michigan, has passed legislation that makes Narcan available by prescription by um, the issuance of a standing order. So you can go into, now in Michigan, you can go into a pharmacy and purchase a Narcan kit over the counter. Um, and I think the cost, I mean, there are a lot of programs that offer them free. Um, community organizations have received grants from the federal government 
Um, obviously, you all know there's an influx of funds now for um, the treatment of opioid addiction, um, and there's some varying um, opinion on whether that money is actually getting where it needs to go. But I know in Michigan, and I'm sure in Minnesota, Wisconsin, there are community organizations that make Narcan kits available free of charge to families um, and to patients who are on high-dose opioids to prevent um, uh, an opioid health presenter uh, having intervention against an opioid overdose. Um, increased access to medication-assisted treatment. The problem with the way the law stands right now is that um, that uh, prescribers of buprenorphine um, have a limit on the number of patients that they can see uh, at any one time or have it actively treated at any one time. So um, I know for a fact that in certain parts of the country there are significant waiting lists or difficulty in accessing um, medication-assisted treatment. Um, some states don't, um, I think, Maybe there, I think there may be one or two states that don't even have methadone programs in their state. Um, so, and, and some of the smaller, some of the southern states, some of the, the western states might only have one or two programs in the entire state. So access to um, uh, medication assisted treatment is difficult in a lot of areas. Um, and then uh, prescription drug monitoring programs or PMPDs in Michigan is called MAP and in Wisconsin and, and uh, uh, Minnesota also have one too. So these are databases that collect information on controlled substances that are prescribed by physicians and dispensed by pharmacies. Now, in Michigan, we have recently, legislation has recently passed that makes um, physicians, uh, uh, physician participation in that mandatory with, uh, with penalties uh, for that. So what, what the law requires is that the physician, um, before prescribing an opioid to a patient, Check their um, check their uh, their profile on the uh, prescription drug monitoring program or, or MAP to see if they are um, um, currently on opioid therapy, if they're getting opioids from, from multiple or other providers, and then um, make the informed decision about whether to prescribe the opioid. Um, so the legislation now in Michigan again is requiring physicians to do that before they prescribe an opioid. There have been there are other um, updated laws too that require a bona fide patient relationship. And this is where the DEA kind of gets some positions, um, uh, and this was big when there was um, um, mail order prescription opioids when you could order them through the mail, and you would have a physician that would talk to you on the phone and take, take a brief history and then write the prescription. Um, the DEA does not do that as a bona fide patient relationship. Um, so now the, the law in Michigan requires a, a, a patient to have a bona fide relationship with a physician, meaning that they see them either face to face or through telehealth to establish it. Um, um, a history, uh, HP, a history of the exam, and um, uh, a treatment plan. So, policy implications for treating this crisis. Again, as I mentioned, increased access to MAP, medication assisted treatment, and other treatments. You know, so wait lists are long, um, especially for persons with Medicaid, and they're, they're far too long. They're not nearly enough data way physicians to manage those patients who wish medication assisted treatment. Um, data way physicians are those that I mentioned earlier that take the training um, to be able to prescribe even more. Um, increased funding and new and innovative approaches to um, uh, the treatment and pharmacological interventions. So medications for treating benzo benzodiazepine and cocaine addiction are in um, uh, research and development phase. Continued research for novel pain management techniques and medications. And then abuse deterrent formulations of opioids. So let me talk about that for just a second, um, the abuse deterrent. So there are different types of abuse deterrent formulations that, that are currently be they're currently available now and that are currently being um, being developed um, um, through the, the pharmaceutical industry. So first are physical chemical barriers. So these are the physical barriers that prevent chewing, crushing, cutting, grating, or grinding of the dosage form of the opioid. So chemical barriers such as gelling agents, um, so what, they, they can resist the extraction of the opioid using common solvents like water. Um, so for example, yeah, uh, if, an, if an addict crushes a, a, an abuse deterrent formulation of an opioid and adds water to it to dissolve it for injection, the, um, uh, it will turn into a gel and it will be, you know, it will be in a, in a form that's unusable by a syringe. 
So that deters, um, that deters, it doesn't deter the oral use of it, but many of the pharmaceutical opioids that addicts use are not taken orally. They're crushed and snorted or used intravenously. Um, so, um, they can, they can, uh, uh, so the, the physical, uh, chemical barriers can limit drug release. Um, and they can change the form of the drug, making it less amenable to um, abuse. Um, Agonist-antagonist combination. So an opioid antagonist can be added to interfere with, reduce, or defeat the euphoria associated with intravenous, intravenous abuse. For example, the, it just uh, as, a, as an example, Suboxone, the drug used in medication assisted treatment, has naloxone in it. So... Um, so suboxone preparations are typically given either, it used to be in tablets, but now they're sublingual or subbuccal tablets. They're put under the tongue or in the cheek. So when used that way, the naloxone, the opioid antagonist that's in the suboxone, is not um, biologically active in the person. It, 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 it's, it's negligible. But if they were to melt, some way melt the, uh, the strip or render it um, uh, in, into an injectable form, and injected it, the naloxone would have full effect because it is it is more active currently than it is it is orally. So, and and there are preparations now with opioids, um, oxy, oxycodone, um, I think hydromorphone, morphine. There are preparations that include both the active drug and naloxone. And again, this doesn't prevent oral abuse, but it would prevent um, crushing and snorting or um, injecting the drug. Um, and then the final um, deterrent formulation would be aversion. So substances can be added to the product to produce an unpleasant effect uh, if it is manipulated or used at a higher dosage than directed. So basically this would involve um, um, adding something that if the drug was crushed and snorted, it would cause intense nasal irritation, you know, violent sneezing, um, things like that, that would make it a less preferable alternative to addicts. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, so, again, prescription drug monitoring programs, policy, it's important. Most states now, I think 48 out of 50 states have prescription drug monitoring programs. Um, uh, physician education at prescribing of opioids. Uh, in Michigan, the Opioid Prescribing Engagement Network, or MOBEN, uh, through Michigan Medicine, which is now with the University of Michigan Medical um, Center, is called Michigan Medicine. Uh, Dr. Michael Anglesby and his colleagues um, have developed um, uh, protocols for the appropriate uh, prescribing of opioids um, pre and po or, excuse me, post surgical. Um, I know that we, through our efforts in, in our uh, um, uh, adverse drug reaction tasks that we're working on. Um, there are there are certainly many 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 um, protocols available now for primary care, for dentistry, for emergency departments on appropriate use of, of opioids and opioid protocols for prescribing, for um, uh, developing treatment plans that include opioids, and for physician education and, and consumer education about opioids. And again, the MLB people have some really nice um, um, <clears throat> uh, consumer-facing um, uh, flyers and brochures that are available free that can be rebranded um, and uh, available to anybody that wants to use them. Um, so I think physician education, I think most physician groups, most specialty physician groups, uh, groups of, 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 of surgeons, emergency room physicians, of primary care physicians, I've seen just reams of information recently on those groups taking up the mantle of promoting um, appropriate opioid prescribing and developing specific protocols for that purpose. And then finally, we get to patient education on the safe use, storage, and disposal of opioids. And again, looking at prescription take-back events, the Department of Justice DEA sponsors two of these a year. I know I'm open sponsors those two different sites in the Ann Arbor area, Ann Arbor, Michigan area, and I'm sure in Michigan and Wisconsin and Minnesota. There are many of those around that um, uh, where it allows patients to take their medication, no questions asked, and turn them into um, a, a, a safe storage unit where they're actually then disposed of appropriately. Um, and so that's what I, I think that, that's another area is, in, is patient education, um, basically on not to, not to pass their medications to others to dispose of 
um, uh, medications um, appropriately, not down the toilet uh, if they get into the water supply, but to get rid of those opioids that sit in their medicine cabinet because that is the number one avenue um, the, uh, for diverted for uh, for opioids to enter the field of diversion, the divert, the, uh, to, to be diverted into illegal use is. Uh, people not throwing them out and, 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 and folks taking them from medicine cabinets and um, diverting them into illegal streams. So uh, please be aware of uh, prescriptions of payback events and box as many police departments have these available in their lobbies. Um, and so um, just check your local area and um, uh, again the DEA diversion website that's up there on the um, uh, in the chat box has um, locations for take back too. Okay, finally, we're gonna, I just want to mention that as we talk about proliferation of opioids, the opioid crisis in general, and we talk about overdoses and, 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 and ways to circumvent that in policy and law enforcement and, and treatment options to address the opioid crisis, we want to remember that addiction is a disease. So it is a, um, it is a brain disease. And it's a chronic progressive illness, and it's, and it's characterized by craving, compulsion, loss of control, continued use despite consequences, and chronic use. So that's the five C's of addiction. So it is not a moral or character or personality flaw, okay? It is not treatable by simply saying no, okay? And another thing to remember is dependence to opioids is not addiction. So patients that are taking opioids, um, as prescribed at appropriate dosage levels, prescribed by a legitimate provider, are certainly probably in a matter of two to three weeks going to become dependent on those substances, meaning that if you were to immediately um, interrupt their, their, their supply of medication, they would have withdrawal symptoms, okay? That, that, that happens with anybody taking an opioid for a period of about 10 days to two weeks on a daily basis, okay, at regularly prescribed dosages. So dependence to opioids is not addiction, okay? Dependent, dependence on maintenance medication, buprenorphine, methadone, is not addiction. Addiction is the chronic progressive disease that has its manifestations in the behavior of the individual where they crave the substance, they have a compulsion, strong compulsion to use it, they cannot control their use, meaning they will go to great lengths to get it, to obtain it, to obtain money to get it, um, will use despite negative consequences. So that's legal, social, economic, financial, marital, um, occupational. You know, they, they can have multiple co negative consequences, and they continue using. And then the chronic use, obviously the chronic use uh, uh, precipitates the continued use, right, that they're using it chronically. Interesting thing about addiction, though, too, is that it does impair the individual's judgment. So it impairs the areas of the brain that are responsible for um, uh, exercising good judgment. So a, a person that is addicted to opioids is not demonstrating good judgment in what they're doing, okay? And it's not their fault. It's not their fault that this is happening. Okay. Yes, they were. They were. They picked up that drug and used it. But nobody picks up a drug for recreational purposes, which is where most of this begins, and decides that they're going to become an addict. Or if they're prescribed an opioid for legitimate medical purposes and they take it and they like the way it makes them feel, they did not set out on that course of saying to themselves, "Gee, I like this. I think I'll become an addict. Or I, I think I'll die." That, that's going to be the furthest thing from their mind. They're using it because they like the way it makes them feel, or initially it was used to treat a, 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 definable, a definable medical condition. I just wanted to remind that. So what's next? So medication-assisted may, treatment may not be the answer, but it may be the best alternative now. Um, so we learned this from the proliferation of methadone programs in the early 70s. Most of you probably don't know that the proliferation of methadone programs in the early 70s was not a social welfare um, uh, decision. It was a anti-crime decision. Richard Nixon was up for re-election in 1972, and there was terrible rates of violent urban crime. And a lot of a lot of vets were coming back from Vietnam addicted to heroin, and there was a lot of crime related to heroin addiction. And Nixon went to his advisors and said, I need a I need something to curb this. And 
um, they, uh, that, that ties in with the, the proliferation of methadone prognosis studies to treat opioid addiction. And the funny thing was is they were pretty successful in reducing harm, um, reducing uh, intravenous drug use, and in reducing the rates of silent crime in major urban cities. So even though it was not implemented as a, as a social welfare policy, um, the outcomes were positive. So we need to remember that, that there's reams of evidence that show that methadone and buprenorphine reduce IV drug use. They reduce the transmission of, of um, hepatitis C, of the HIV. Uh, uh, it, 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 it may be a harm reduction strategy, but it does reduce the person's harm, okay, and allows them to get back on track and develop um, other social supports to, to then become a fully functioning individual. So paradigm shift need to occur, treating addiction and mental health in, in parity with medical conditions. You know, we talk a lot here at MPRO and, and LSQIN about um, integrating behavioral health into primary care, and integrating behavioral health. So that paradigm shift needs to occur. It's beginning, right? It's happening. We all know that. You guys all work in, 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 um, in um, uh, practices or, or agencies or organizations where you can see this happening on a daily basis, but it, 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 the, the shift needs to continue to occur and go farther. Um, interdiction may not work. Again, we live in a culture where um, we like to al- we like to alter our consciousness, plain and simple. Um, and um, alcohol, nicotine, caffeine, any kind of stimulant, we like them. Uh, and so interdiction may not work. You know, there's a demand there be product. And I just want to say just a mention of legalization of cannabis, which in Michigan is up on the ballot this November for legalization. We do have medical marijuana now. Um, but it's up for legalization. My opinion is that cannabis is a gateway drug. Um, there is uh, no question in my mind that if you talk to anybody who is a current heroin or opioid addict, most of them will probably tell you they either use cannabis on a regular basis previously or currently or were introduced to, to, all, to uh, mood-altering substances through cannabis. So I'm not sure that the legalization of cannabis in Michigan or any other state is going to do a whole heck of a lot for um, the opioid problem. Um, there are people that think otherwise, um, and that's it, just my humble opinion that um, legalization of cannabis is probably not going to do much for the opioid. Um, um, but one other thing I do want to talk about, too, is we talk about shifting the paradigm to um, parity of mental health and medical conditions is looking at the syndrome, syndromes. Um, Dr. Corey Waller, um, uh, 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 I, I, he mentioned these uh, in, in, in a discussion I had with him recently, and it was the first time I heard these, and, and it made a lot of sense. So in trying to address behavioral health and primary care, we have to be recognized that these sentinel syndromes, such as the, the four, are addiction, behavioral health, chronic pain, and cognitive impairment, that if these issues aren't addressed in primary care, patients will not get better, and they will continue to digress. They will continue to use substance. They will continue to get sicker and sicker and sicker, um, causing increased um, expenditure of dollars in their care and and then make them more complex care patients. Um, So just a thought on that, that as we begin to look at shifting the paradigm to to look up the definition and look up sentinel syndrome and see what you think about that. And that, um, you know, again, addiction, behavioral health, chronic pain and cognitive management, the need for those to be addressed in primary care for those patients to get better. And, again, addiction and uh, is mentioned in that. And that is all I have. I think we have a few minutes for questions. If anybody has it, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question at this time, please press the number one key on your telephone keypad. If you have a question at this time, please press the number one key on your telephone keypad. We are waiting for callers to join the queue. So we do have one question in the chat box from Patty saying, I appreciated your acknowledgement of addiction being a disease. That being said, is there any discussion at all about moving away from methadone and that much CRT? The clinics are not working on getting these people off methadone. It appears to be a lifelong situation. Uh, Thanks for the question. You know, that is a, that is a conundrum with medication-assisted treatment. And <clears throat> I didn't mention it here, but I have in other presentations I've done on this topic, that the idea becomes is like when when do you then withdraw the patient from methadone and 
um, medication assisted treatment, uh, methadone or buprenorphine. Now, you're absolutely right. For some people, this may be a lifelong medication, similar to, uh, similar to insulin or, or, or antihypertensive medicine, um, cardiac medicine. It may be a lifelong, um, uh, 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 part of their treatment plan. For, for younger patients, I would imagine as they, as they get older, um, and start uh, look, thinking about starting a family, graduating from college or going to college and starting a career, they're going to not want to be tied to a medication. Um, and they may be looking for a, 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 a way to withdraw or weaning from that. So the weaning of these, of, of these medications that are either opioid agonist pure methadone or agonist antagonist buprenorphine, that it's purely down to the, the, the relationship between the, the physician and the patient. Um, it does take quite a bit of time to, to wean from methadone and buprenorphine, um, and because the dosages typically uh, are, are small, are incrementally decreased over time. Um, so that is a good question. And I, again, I don't know the answer to it. I'm, I'm kind of jumping around here, but I don't know if I know the answer to that because I do know that absence-based programs for a lot of people, especially young people, just don't work real well. Um, they can go through them. You can spend multiple thousands of dollars to put somebody through 28 days of treatment in an inpatient program, and they can see a kid's relapse a, a day later. The day they get out of treatment is two days later if they get out of treatment. Um, and that, I mean, the treatment was wasted because there's been a seed planted, but um, absent-based programs um, are, are a lot harder for I think the younger patients, the 18 to 30, the 18 to 28, 25. It's a little harder for them, I think, to um, look at absent-based programs. But there are many, many, many available, many available. So, um, and I don't know if they're looking at any other substances now. Uh, obviously, Vivitrol would be an option where it acts as a blockade and um, there's the euphoric effect with the Vivitrol. So that might be an option for people that are uh, don't want to become um, dependent on another substance um, and uh, 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 and then still try to make, try to develop a recovery program. We have a question from Eric Lowry. Please go ahead. No, I don't have a question. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question at this time, please press the number one key. If you have a question at this time, please press the number one key on your telephone keypad. Okay, if we're waiting, while we're waiting for questions, just remind everyone I saw a thing in the chat. Where, who do I email for attendance? Um, you will get an email from um, Wisconsin uh, Metastar, our partner, um, for those of you that registered, okay? So if your email was in the registration, if you registered yourself, you will get an email to complete the evaluation and get your certificate. If you were part of a listening group, you can email me at mlausch at mpro.org. My name is up there. And tell me that you were in a listening room. I'm listening with someone else who was registered, and I will forward your name and email to uh, my colleague in, in, uh, at Metastar, and you will get your certificate. You'll get the, the link to the evaluation for the certificate, okay? And those usually come out about five to seven to ten days after the event. So don't worry that you don't get it tomorrow or the next day. It, it'll get to you. We're really good about this um, and been doing this for a while. So uh, you, you'll get the certificate. If for sorry you don't, give me an, you know, send me an email, and I'll make sure that you do. I want to thank you all today on behalf of the Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network for listening to my presentation today. I hope you found it um, um, rewarding and, and, uh, and you learned at least one new thing. Um, and, yeah, go ahead. Do we have a question? There are no further questions at this time. Very good. Um, so, again, I thank you all for participating. Look for your, um, your emails for the CE uh, uh, and evaluation and have a great day.